Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we explore the art of improving existing software with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we are joined by Monica Lent, who has been a software engineer in leadership roles, a travel and technical blogger, speaker, and is currently working on a number of new startups. Monica joins us today from Berlin, Germany. Monica Lent, we're so glad to have you on Maintainable. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Robbie. So as you reflect on your experience in the industry, what do you believe are a few common characteristics of, dare I say, maintainable software? So I think one of the biggest things is, you know, people don't necessarily start out with a plan when they are creating code in an early stage startup, but at some point you have to get strategic about it. You have to start putting in those clear boundaries into the software. So I think something where people have thought about those boundaries and how they map to the teams that are going to be working on different parts of code is probably one of the most important things that lets you build code base that scales along with the company that's scaling at the same time. Can you give me an example, maybe in a, a, like something tangible, what you mean by boundaries? Are we talking about Yeah, for sure. So for instance, at my previous company that I worked at, we had teams that were oriented around different parts of our front-end application, and then they were also responsible for all of the back-end services. This can be a little bit tricky because in the back-end world, you know, you have this concept of microservices. It's supposed to be all kind of cut and dry. You know, someone owns this service and that provides a certain utility to the front-end. But in the front-end, it's a bit harder to make those boundaries clear. And oftentimes a user is going to go across a lot of different teams code in order to accomplish a specific task. So thinking about teams and the code in a way that it kind of maps to those user journeys is one of the ways that we created those boundaries along, you know, what the user was doing and how the software could be, could be built and constructed. So grouping together those features in a logical way, not just in terms of the journey, but also you know, how can you bundle them together kind of in the code base and say, okay, these are the places this team's going to work on. And there are clear, there's a clear separation. So they don't share logic. They don't maybe share certain kinds of utilities. Even if that means some duplication, it's okay because you can feel confident that that team's going to be able to ship without impacting somebody else. That's interesting. So are you saying that like the previous place that you were working at, you organize your teams in a way that they were focused around a specific set of user journeys and versus front end and back end being split up as their own two segments, or was there still that kind of segment on what area of the stack people were focused on? Yeah, exactly. So the teams were cross-functional and this meant that anytime they wanted to ship something, they had the skills that were necessary to ship that feature. And It's not necessarily the most natural way when you're starting at a company, right? A lot of us who start at more early stage companies, you have a front end team and you have a back end team. And that's, you know, it kind of makes sense because people have that affinity towards other people who have the same kind of code. You know, it's kind of like a natural grouping, but it's not scalable. So when you think about the user journeys and how you can enable people to build features that enable those kind of user journeys to happen, then naturally you're going to organize your code in a different way. Interesting. And in in those scenarios, I'm assuming that you might have had these different cross-functional teams that did they switch teams at all very often or like do they, I'm assuming there's some overlap and, you know, where they would need to collaborate amongst themselves or switch teams for a while to get acclimated to another environment. Yeah, so there was definitely a period at my last company where we had to kind of transition from one model of working to another model of working. And transition is hard for pretty much anybody. You know, you have a tech stack you're familiar with, you have teammates that you have built a rapport with, and making that adjustment, it can be exciting at the beginning, but it can also be really challenging. So yeah, there was definitely an an adjustment period where people had to go into different teams. And you know, what makes that also more complex is when you're working in a distributed environment, like a lot of us are these days, even more so. And what we did was we actually had people from different offices in different parts of the world, working together on those cross-functional teams at the beginning so that 
They could, you know, learn the different parts of the tech stack that maybe people in different offices were the best equipped. So we had back end primarily in one office and front end primarily in another office. And what we had to do is actually build local teams that were able to be self-sufficient by having all of those skills in a single place. So there was definitely like quite a long period of making that transition, but at the end of the day, it you know, streamlined communication quite a bit once we could finally get all the skills on a single team in a single space. Did those in like approximately how large of a team were you trying to optimize around? Is it, it was the size even a factor or is it just like a team and then there'd be like smaller sub teams within that organization? Yeah. So what we did is we had teams, I would say they were t- typically between five and 10 people. Uh, although sometimes they would get bigger, of course, and it became natural that you had to split them up. Right. And Obviously, it's not something that is super easy to do when you have already kind of defined the domain of a team, you know, and then suddenly you might have to create not an artificial boundary, but you have to figure out how do I adjust to the fact that now this has become bigger and and kind of it it needed more than just a single small team working on it. And sometimes that means building separate applications. Sometimes it means kind of rethinking or even sometimes making sacrifices Um, for example, things like performance or things like code duplication, because you realize that uh, it's actually going to help people ship faster if they don't have to do day-to-day coordination. Have you often used the metaphor of technical debt in your day-to-day work? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I've I've actually given a, a conference talk. I think that's how we got in touch about the topic of technical debt. And it's, yeah, it's one of those things where everybody has a different definition and it makes people feel a lot of emotions <laughs> when it comes up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So how do you currently define that? So the definition that I tend to give is that it's a piece of code, a tool, infrastructure, or even a process that makes you slower and less efficient at shipping whatever you're trying to do at the end of the day. And it does this in a way that is repeatable and observable. So, you know, just because you have some, some, let's say, piece of code, you have to touch it every once in a while, and it doesn't really affect your day-to-day work. Of course, you could say that it is technical debt, but putting technical debt as a label on something is such a strong statement. You know, if you're in like a, an engineering leadership meeting and someone says this is technical debt, you know, <laughs> it kind of like warrants some concern, right? Because people are like, is this going to become a real issue? So I think it's extremely important that when you actually like take that label and put it on something in the context of a team or an organization, that you do it in an intentional way or else you run the risk of people being like, well, you said that was technical debt and it hasn't been a problem in six months and you can kind of like burn that trust. What's interesting about what you're saying there, I like that you you touch on, you know, it's repeatable but also observable so people can identify it, see it happening, be like, okay, this keeps happening versus, you know, in that scenario where someone throws out their technical debt card, throws it on the table or whatever, or in a Zoom meeting or wherever people are these days, it says technical debt, concern, red flag, whatever, wondering how to best address that. Did, did you find that it was maybe often overused or by people within you know the organizations that you've worked a part of or, um, or did you disagree with it more often than not? How, what's your takeaway on like how other people use it? Because I think everybody thinks that the way that they use it ends up being the right way, but it's always other people. And it's usually when they're talking about other people's code too, that they're using that card. So I'm always curious about that. Yeah, definitely. So it is you know, one of the easiest plays when you inherit some code and you don't really like it. Uh, it's very easy to kind of throw out that label of technical debt and kind of assume that this is going to give you maybe a blank check to rewrite it or, you know, that's, something that maybe there are product priorities, but hey, there's technical debts and we remember what happened last time when we didn't deal with it. So yeah, I would say in my experience, it does happen a lot that people inherit code and then technical debt kind of gets like thrown out as as a label for that code. But I also think that's something where over time, as people mature in their career, certainly as I matured in my career, 
uh, you know, I'm not blameless on this either. I have certainly uh, labeled things as, as technical debt while being a little bit naive about how they got to be that way, how complex the underlying problem really was. Um, so that also kind of, I think, fades with time uh, and just experience. Yeah, that, that's been my observation too, uh, is that it feels like there's this, there's interesting confidence period in people's arc of their career where they're like, oh, now I've, I I know enough to be to like do a lot now as a software developer. And then I think you get become more humble over the years. You're like, OK, actually, it's, it's way more complicated. And it's always that like, oh, if I could just redo this, like it'd be it'd be better next time. And I think oftentimes what I hear from different people on teams and, and I've seen myself is that there's this I think there's we're taught how to build things kind of like from scratch usually. And then we jump into existing situations and we're like, well, I don't understand all the piece building blocks that got us to here, but if I were to redo it, I would have a better understanding of it. And I know how we'd get to that in theory, uh, whether or not a rewrite or whatever would be an appropriate thing to do. I'm always so interested in how technical debt becomes this thing that people can throw out and to, to kind of almost be like a threat, but I don't think they mean it maliciously. I always think it's more of a, I don't know how to, I don't yet have the skills or even really good understanding of how to cleanly refactor this or rethink this mess, what I perceive as a mess to make it more sense of it. So I'm going to throw that label out there because then I'll, if I do from my, again, I'll understand it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be understood by the someone three to years down the road that comes in and joins your organization that they understand what you did in the same way. So anyway, anyways, enough about technical debt. So, you know, while preparing for the discussion, I know saw that you were doing the 12 startups in 12 months challenge. You Could you introduce the audience to that and share what prompted you to engage or participate in it? Yeah, for sure. So building 12 startups in 12 months was not originally my idea. So if anybody is listening, has kind of followed the indie software scene or indie maker scene. The person who popularized this is named Peter Levels. Um, he kind of famously shipped, I think, I think he made it to about eight products over the course of eight months or so, one or two of which have become particularly profitable. And the core like concept behind it is that you don't wait to validate your idea. You don't wait to, you know, let's say, ship something that is going to be completely perfect or feature complete, or maybe even have like the fanciest tech stack if you were going to leave yourself to, you know, your own devices as developers, we tend to choose, let's say, excessive tech stacks for our personal projects because it's a chance to learn. But if your goal is really to build a profitable business, then the first and most important thing you need to do is distribute it, get people using it and see, do they care and will they pay money for it? So that's kind of the main idea behind shipping one startup a month is that you kind of take away all of your options to kind of procrastinate getting it into the hands of real people who can tell you if it's valuable. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I have been doing because I run a, a SaaS product and I have been building that for, yeah, well over a year and I have paying users. It's going great, but at the same time, it is a challenge to scale it. So what I wanted to do is learn from this. You know, what are some ways that I can iterate? I can build growth channels for these products and really do it in a way that is very efficient and time boxed. So kind of taking away that option to work towards perfection and just getting it out and seeing if people really care about what I'm creating. Sounds fun. I'm curious if you could, are you open to sharing a little bit about your SaaS product as well? Yeah, for sure. So it is an affiliate analytics tool. So it's for people who are running uh, websites where they maybe promote products as an affiliate, where you, you know, share a recommendation for something and get a commission if people buy it. And I learned a bit about this industry as someone who was building a profitable uh, travel website where that was how I was earning money. And behind it is an analytics platform. It's built on um, Google Cloud Platform and all of the data is stored in BigQuery. And of course I have learned the, learned the hard way that BigQuery can be expensive if you decide to just delete stuff. Uh, so yeah, it has been quite a journey uh, learning that it's all built uh, serverless, which has been really interesting. 
but that's also what has allowed us to scale up when we have to suddenly onboard someone who has a website that is receiving millions of visits per month. So yeah, that has been that has been quite a journey, uh, especially coming from working at a company that had a code base that was started, let's say, uh, seven years prior. The technical landscape has changed so much, and it is incredible what you just get out of the box uh, these days when you are working with stuff that is just built into platforms like AWS and GCP. Um, I haven't dug too deeply into serverless. There's a few projects that we have some some small pieces of uh, like client projects infrastructure that are set up in there. I'm so curious about how teams are thinking about maintenance and collaborating on that type of work together in an effective way when it kind of feels like it's a little removed in some ways. Have you, uh, how, how, what's been your experience so far with that? Yeah, so the thing about this is that I'm working on a team of two, so me and my partner. So I haven't really had the problem necessarily of, you know, needing to be concerned about what other people are doing. But at the same time, I can definitely imagine that if you are working on a large team, I mean, our product is comparatively small, I suppose, compared to something that would be much bigger or more mature, but we still have over a hundred cloud functions that, you know, they, some of them need to be deployed in, not necessarily in coordination, but they do, you know, connect to each other in some way and trying to transfer that knowledge to other people. I mean, it's the same in, in any kind of architecture, I suppose. When you have parts that depend on each other in some form or fashion, trying to keep up to date that documentation, make sure that people know it, it is a challenge. Uh, so I could imagine that serverless takes this on an even more micro level and you're dealing with even more moving parts. So yeah, that, that could be interesting, but of course there are people doing it and I would love to learn more about that myself. Hi there. Do you know someone who might be looking for assistance with their Ruby on Rails application? Planet Argon would love to meet them. We're offering a $1,000 referral bonus. Send someone our way, and if they sign up for services with Planet Argon, we'll give them a $1,000 discount. And in return, you'll get a check for $1,000 in the mail, just for knowing the right person. Hop on over to planetargon.com slash referrals for more information and to refer someone our way. That's planetargon.com slash referrals. Thanks. You know, in one of the in one of your talks that you've given at a number of different conferences, uh, you discuss con- concepts around building resilient front-end architecture. In this context, what do you mean by resilient? So the main thing that I think about when I think about resilient architecture is how is it going to kind of bounce back from any attempts that are naturally occurring that a team might make to cause it to degrade? Because the architecture shouldn't rely on people having perfect adherence to best practices. Because the reality is, We are humans, sometimes we are under pressure, sometimes we're lazy, that happens too, you know, and and that's okay. We shouldn't necessarily expect that people will be perfect all the time for our architecture and the systems that we build to be maintainable. So the question is, how can we, through things like automation, find ways to take out that human element that causes our systems to degrade on their own? Could you provide like an example around, say, where automation could counter degradation? Absolutely. So one of my favorite examples and something that has been pretty well received when I've given this talk is the concept of forbidden dependency tests. So these are not so common in the front end world and maybe not in a lot of other worlds. But what it allows you to do is instead of just writing tests that, you know, assert behavior of your software, you can also create tests that assert the structure of the dependencies within your application. So let's say that I have a certain subset of some directories in my application. I organize my code base in a way that it kind of mirrors the structure of our teams. Then I can write tests which say, you know, one team may not use directly the code of another team. 
you know, except in a few very specific places or situations. So it's very natural that, you know, you might be typing out some kind of function, some utility, maybe even your editor wants to auto import it for you. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you are depending on some code that somebody else uh, has written. And while we might imagine that people have perfect unit tests, the reality is that they don't. And so if we can get to a point where we have these clear boundaries and we have some automation to help us make sure those boundaries are in place, yes, you will have production problems, but what's more important is that those production problems are not cross team. So one team doesn't cause problems for another team because this leads you know, not only to a very confusing uh, situation dealing with the production issue, but of course it causes conflict between those teams because it's frustrating when somebody causes a bug and then you're called in to fix it and you didn't even know that they deployed perhaps and now you had to go dig through those issues. So that's one way that I think we can use some you know, relatively simple automation to share a code base and kind of work together, but also just make it clear which responsibilities belong to which pieces of code um, and not just depend on telling people these are the rules, you know, and, and say, okay, the code reviewer is expected to have like an eagle eye where they can go in and always spot that. So yeah, that's something that definitely worked for us and uh, it kind of trains people going forward not to do that either. So that's interesting. So you have like scenarios where there's, in say your builds or what have you, where they are checking to, based off of who the author of, say, code changes were, like who's making the code changes, whether or not they're overstepping their boundaries and working in an area of the repository that they probably shouldn't be interacting with or leveraging? Um, not so much. So we did have like the concept of code owners um, for some situations where maybe you want to make sure uh, that someone who is an expert in something gets to review that. So I worked in a fintech environment um, it was highly international, so you can possibly imagine that there is a lot of business logic that goes into making the system run. And in that sense, what we did is we just made sure that the, the utilities that people were using were clearly in a place where they were common to everybody and that those necessarily had to be well tested. And we did have, of course, rules about unit test coverage and so forth when people wrote new code. But also at the same time, we were migrating an application kind of piece by piece uh, from AngularJS to ReactJS. And this meant that sometimes you, you knew things weren't going to be perfect. And that's the reality of software. It's not perfect. And, and if you behave as though it will be perfect, you know, you set yourself up for even more problems. So it was really about making sure that code sharing happened in an intentional way. And that if people weren't supposed to be sharing code, uh, even if it was slightly less efficient, they would duplicate whatever was necessary, or they would put it in a very specific place where shared code belonged, and that had even higher uh, test coverage standards. Hmm. You know, I wanted to dig into that. I know that you've talked a bit about the Angular to React migration. Is that the type of project where you were able to, you, where you needed to still have ongoing development and support of the application? So new features were being worked on potentially while also needing to migrate at the same time. And did, did you have to have that those two frameworks coexist for a period of time? Absolutely. So it's one of those things that's kind of like changing, changing the engine in a flying airplane or whatever the metaphor is supposed to be. So that was definitely something that made it a lot harder than if you could just magically stop shipping features or, or um, you know, adding value for the business at any given point just to do this migration. So that was not the, the luxurious position that we would have been in. How did you go about approaching that as a team? So what we did is we went, we started at a point where we had Angular as kind of the outer shell of the application, and then we worked screen by screen. Uh, so every different part of the application, you could kind of mix and match. So we had these kind of bridges that would connect Angular to React in a relatively, you know, in a clear way. So there were very clear boundaries between where is the React code and where is the Angular code. And as time went on, we were eventually able to kind of flip that so that the shell was actually React 
And then we had just a few kind of portals where Angular would still be embedded. And then eventually we're able to remove Angular altogether. So it was a piece by piece operation and it took something like two years. So it was, it was absolutely not something where, you know, we had everybody full steam working on it. At the same time, the company was expanding its geographical footprint, you know, doing acquisitions of other companies. There was a ton of stuff going on. So it was definitely a long-term, long-term project that you had to have a lot of kind of like stamina to say, okay, we're going to keep moving forward, you know, and every step forward is progress that's meaningful for us. Nice. You know, if you're, if you're open to it, would you share a little bit about some of the, the organization's decisions to make that migration in the first place? Yeah. So the big thing was that the company reached a point where we were going to scale up. It was very clear. So we acquired one of our closest competitors and suddenly at that point, the size of the company basically doubled. And from that point onwards, we also started doubling the number of engineers, the number of employees on an annual basis at least. So what happened was that, yeah, I went to some of the engineering leadership and I was like, look, if we are going to really scale this and we are going to build teams in more locations, We can't have the same kind of architecture, the same kind of code base that worked when we were two devs sitting next to each other and one designer who was also coding in Angular. You know, these are just completely different environments. And so from that point, it was also clear that AngularJS was kind of falling out of favor. There was the introduction of Angular 2, uh, which would have itself been a huge migration. So we investigated, you know, what would it take to migrate to Angular 2? Uh, versus, you know, should we move to something like React? And at the end of the day, we were going to end up with a migration anyways, because one, it's very hard to attract developers to join your team and help you scale up when you're using something that is very out of favor, um, as AngularJS was becoming at the time. And I'm not someone who likes to just follow like the technology hype, especially like as a former manager, I'm like, oh, come on, we've got to use like the well-tested, you know, battle-hardened, all of those technologies uh, because I don't like doing migrations. I don't like selling them to management when it's not necessary. But uh, it was pretty clear that going forward, we couldn't just keep writing AngularJS and expect that the best engineers would want to work on an AngularJS code base because those skills they were learning would also not necessarily serve them at their next job. So it was kind of two parts. We needed to scale up. We needed to do some serious test automation. We needed to separate uh, the logic from the view. We needed to make it as clean as possible. But at the same time, we also needed to do something that would allow us to scale the team and hire the kind of people we wanted to hire. Well, that makes sense. And th- th- thanks for sharing some background on that. I'm always curious about how decisions like that get made because you know I, I work with technology that's previously been in you know in more popular in, in in some in some capacity like Ruby on Rails in particular. And then it's not like as in as it used to be, but we still use it all the time. And we you know we get to be the people that come in and take over those older code bases when their developers move on to go work with some other technologies or elsewhere. And so. It keeps us busy, but you also know that like there's reasons why organizations need to think about technology in terms of like how you're going to think of plan your recruitment strategy and retention employee retention is a big part of that. Knowing that also like the Angular migration itself was going to be a big challenge for a lot of organizations. I think it's in- interesting in, in retrospect wondering how maybe not being as uh, smooth as it could have potentially have been, or if that was maybe disastrous for that framework itself long-term, you know, obviously these things evolve and change over time. So we'll see, but so it's interesting, you know, when it comes to documenting and prioritizing time to address, say, technical debt type issues, upgrades up, what are some of the processes that you've found to be very effective for teams on how to like capture that information and prioritize them and then decide when you can address them? Honestly, this is something that I have, I've struggled with. And I think a lot of people who are working as some kind of an engineering lead, you know, you always have this tug of like delivering value for the business and for the customers. And at the same time, you also have developers who, you know, they maybe struggle with a certain part of the code base or uh, something is not ideal. And it's kind of like our job to kind of suss out like, 
how much is this really affecting you and what is going to be the long-term impact? So what I've seen and what I think has worked relatively well is just dedicating a certain percentage of every sprint to topics that the engineers feel are important. And then it's kind of up to them to bring those forward and say, all right, this is something that I really want to work on because X, Y, Z, I think this is going to set us up for the future. And this approach is also a lot more palatable, I think, for uh, people in product, people who are in management, than trying to sell these large rewrites. And you can also always say, look, you know, if we don't do this piece by piece, we're going to have a big problem later. You know, they've been there. They have, I think you can tell when someone who's working in product has been through like a technical debt disaster. Like a lot of times they have that kind of like trauma or like that experience where they're like, okay, I know what's coming if I don't, you know, give a little bit here. But I think the hard part is that engineers, a lot of time, they don't, they don't really want to speak up because they feel bad advocating for something that won't help users. Especially in my experience, when people are front-end developers, a lot of them empathize so much with the people who they're building something for. You know, it brings them joy when, when uh, someone's using their product. And then to say, okay, I don't want to do something for them, which, you know, maybe is a UX improvement or maybe improving something on mobile, but I have to work on something invisible. Sometimes they really do struggle and it's it's our job as as people who are working in, in leadership to, to give them that courage and support them uh, to bring those issues forward. Because I think at some point down the down the line, that stuff is going to prevent you from delivering stuff as quickly and as effectively and reliably or resiliently uh, as you would like your you'd like to be doing as an engineer as well. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about blogging in particular. Because I know you've done a lot of blogging. You mentioned your travel website and stuff as well. I was doing a little bit of research on you, and you have a lot of photos of, of you around the pl- on the planet. Outside of like wanting to ask questions about how you're coping during a pandemic, outside of that, when it comes to blogging and maybe in particular technical blogging, how do you go? Do you, have you developed a process or a workflow for coming up with ideas and things that you think you should consider writing and sharing? So there are a lot of different ways to approach this. And I think the ones that tend to resonate the most with readers are things where you take your own personal experience and you package it in a way that there are lessons that other people can learn from it. So for example, I wrote an article about my experience thinking that I was a senior developer and turning out, you know, five years later, I realized that I wasn't. Um, And I think a lot of people, I, I suspect a lot of people are in a similar situation where you get a senior title and you think, okay, I'm like at the pinnacle of my career, uh, only to realize a few years later that you had no idea what you were doing. Um, at least that's what happened to me. What really like worked for me in terms of writing about this experience was taking, you know, these kind of relatable topics that a lot of people feel in their day-to-day job, which is things like, you know, I have to document everything or it's not clean code unless, you know, it's formatted the way that I would have written it and framing it as my own experience so that people can both learn from it, but also it doesn't come across as being preachy or entitled or whatever it is. Because one of the most frustrating things probably ever is when you're reading a technical article or you're talking to someone and they assume that they know what you're going through because everybody's tech debt is different, right? Everybody is in a different organization with a different context. And I think the best way that we as developers can write and blog in a way that we teach people, but without being presumptuous, is sharing our own lessons from production, uh, from the things that we've been through, uh, and packaging them as you know something where people can take the bits that they like and relate to without assuming uh, that they're going to be in the exact same situation as us. That's a, that's a good way to look at that. I'm curious if you, for those listening that haven't that they've always been curious about blogging, but they're like, I don't know that I have anything new to share because I use, I can use a search 
engine. I can go to Google and look up something and someone's already, there's, I can find 10 articles kind of similar to something that I just recently built. So, and I needed to rely on seven of them to help me build it myself. So who am I to write, write about this topic when someone else has already written about it? What do you have to say to those types of people that are internalizing that and, and or at least it's a, it's a hurdle to kind of overcome? Yeah, I think what's really important is, you know, if you don't feel like you're qualified to talk about a topic, there's always the option to just frame what's your experience and what's your exposure to that topic at the beginning of your article. So let's say you're, I don't know, you're writing about doing an Angular to React migration, but you haven't finished the entire migration yet. This is a totally valid thing to include at the beginning of an article. You can say, hey, this is the strategy that we're working with. This is what we've learned so far. We estimate we are about 20% of the way through uh, and start a conversation with people. So end the article with a call to connect with you by email or on Twitter and just say, you know, if you've been through this, then give us your ideas. Um, and I think treating this more as a dialogue instead of just a broadcast uh, is one way to kind of add to the conversation about a given topic. Um, but yeah, I think what's really important is that when you want to write content and you want to write a technical article where people are gonna care about the author and not just like copy paste and go on their way, it's really important to inject that into what you're writing. So who am I? What's my experience? What's my context? Um, and if you want to like get in touch with me and talk more about this, here's, here's how you can do it. So that's, that's, I think kind of the main way I would suggest people who maybe don't feel qualified can still talk about technical topics, but giving that frame of reference. We'll be back with our interview with Monica in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I want to take a quick moment to thank you for making time to listen to the Maintainable Podcast. If you're finding these discussions valuable, please consider sharing a link amongst your peers and a writing review on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Also, do you know someone in the industry that I should be interviewing on Maintainable? Shoot me an email to Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm. And now, back to our interview with Monica Lind. Have you been blogging to some capacity for most of your professional career? I would say so. I What I learned about blogging primarily, I learned a lot, practically speaking, from writing for travel. And then I kind of mapped all of those learnings back to, back to tech and back to conference speaking. So it was really the pure volume that I've written are on other topics, but that's the strategy is kind of translatable, I think, because at the end of the day, people are people. And if you understand the audience, what they care about, what they value, the same the same strategies can apply. The reason I'm curious about that was, you know, I early on in my career, I started blogging a technical capacity about technical blogging. And I wouldn't say I was remotely a good writer at all, but I was like, here's what I'm learning. And I'm figuring there wasn't a lot of documentation for the f tools and frameworks that I was using back at that point in time. And if I couldn't find the answer to something, I would share what I figured out and like, it might be helpful to someone else. Or if anything, I know that I can go back and look references myself later. That helped me kind of get more exposure to a larger audience. And then my company started to grow, I think as a direct correlation to that. And then, and then I had a larger audience and then I realized because I was getting good, some help, helpful feedback from people that, hey, you've got a lot of grammar errors in your writing and stuff like that. And then, so I found that ended up being this weird barrier for me to publish as often as, as I was because I was, I knew that there were people that were being more critical of some of the content that I was producing grammar wise. But I was like, well, if you look at the code bits, you, it's I, okay. Yeah, I could probably improve. But I think that ended up like in a weird way preventing me from producing as much as I used to because I was more worried about editing it while I was writing it. And that became, it just became a couple extra hurdles. And then, and I also, but I say that in one capacity, then another excuse I've kind of given myself or labeled is that I think when I was learning something, it felt like it was much easier for me to share what I was learning as I was learning it. And then I got to a certain point where I'm like, I'm supposed to know most of this now. So now that I know a lot of this stuff, I don't feel like I'm learning new things in the same capacity that I have something to talk about it. So how have you kind of navigated that where you've become more, say, 
you have more expertise in something to still feel like you can share in more of a, and, and keep that sort of tone of being like, okay, I, people are expecting me to have more of a authoritative view on this yet. I really don't know what the hell I'm talking about here exactly. And so trying to like, I, I think I'm looking for some free advice here on that. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's super important that when you, you know, you end up with more readers or people become more familiar with your work, that it's so important to also kind of set an example for other people and say, I just don't know. I don't have a formulated opinion on this. I had somebody ask me the other day on Twitter if I had quote unquote thought leadership on something. And I was like, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about this. So they asked me something as, as though I would have had a, a deep and philosophical reason. And I'm like, I'm just guessing like anybody else. Um, but I think it's just really important to be open about that because especially something I realized before I started to do conference speaking is that people who are in the public eye in tech, maybe they have a lot of followers on Twitter, you know, they, they get nervous about speaking before going on stage. You know, they also like get a stomach ache or feel sick or feel uncomfortable or, you know, when you have a lot of followers on Twitter, when you publish something, it can also be nerve wracking or like I send out a newsletter to, oh, you know, 4,000 people. It's like terrifying and that, <laughs> that's totally okay. So I'm not sure if I necessarily have like a perfect answer, but I think that being able to like be vulnerable is really important because people have to realize that even those in the quote unquote public eye on the internet, if you want to put it like that, they're totally normal people with all of the same uh, emotions and flaws and, and struggles as anybody else. Um, and no, it actually doesn't necessarily get better when more people are reading your stuff. It can actually get harder and you get more like critical of your own work um, and it becomes more difficult. So it's better to take advantage of that time until then to be prolific uh, and learn from, learn from producing a lot as opposed to holding yourself to like that high, highest bar uh, when people aren't reading it yet. I know that you have a, a, a newsletter. Could you tell our audience a little bit about that? Yeah. So the newsletter is, it starts as a seven day free email course, which basically teaches developers about blogging. So you start by coming up with an idea. It has some strategies for where your ideas can come from. It explains some core concepts about SEO. So how do you make your article search friendly? How do you do things like keyword research, which most developers are just not aware is still a thing. Um, and is super important. Um, and then it also goes into things like writing for an online audience. How do you keep people's attention when, you know, these days, like you have fleets, uh, above your Twitter screen, things moving everywhere. Like, you know, how do you like maintain the, the attention of a reader for a long form article when they're looking at it on their phone? Um, and then it finally goes into distribution. And at the end, after they have gone through all of this, they stay subscribed for a weekly newsletter, which goes more into depth on these different topics. So yeah, it's been pretty cool because people publish new articles and then they tag me and say, hey, thanks so much for like, you know, giving me some of the tools that, that helped me publish this. Maybe it was so successful. I had someone write me and say, I made 30 bucks on Medium after implementing your tips. Like, <laughs> if, if I, you keep it up, I will have to like give you money because it was whatever. I don't know anything about writing on Medium, but it's very rewarding because uh, you have a lot of people who put in the work and they see results. And yeah, it's a great feeling. That's great. And where can people subscribe to that? Uh, it's available at bloggingfordevs.com. So. Excellent. We'll definitely include a link to that in the show notes as well for everyone. So I want to get a quick piece of advice from you for our audience. So let's assume there are a few software developers listening to this episode. They've been at their company for a few years now and don't feel like their concerns about the long-term maintainability have been heard by, say, the product owners, or perhaps they've heard future many times, not right now, maybe later, you know, maybe in Q1, we'll, we'll reevaluate that a few too many times and they've started to give up and, and outside of them thinking, maybe I should start looking for a new job. What advice could you offer them today on how do they start addressing that issue? One thing that I've observed in 
my years work at working in software, is that sometimes asking for permission is also an excuse to hear the word no. So do you really need permission to bring your code to the level that you think it should be at? When I started at my previous job, there were no tests, which shocked me. I was, mo I was moving from research uh, and academia into the startup world, and I had a lot of expectations that when I was going to arrive there, you know, there would be pull requests, there would be like great test coverage, I was going to work in TDD with some amazing teams, and it turned out people were just trying to survive, ship fast, and uh, the designer was the one coding most of the Angular app at that point, and it was completely different than what I'd expected. But if I had just waited for people to accept that there would be tests, there would be no tests. Um, so what I did is I implemented tests. And of course, uh, this can be tricky because you, when you come into a new team, you don't wanna be the arrogant one. I was the arrogant one, so don't make that mistake. It, you have to be diplomatic about it. But at the same time, you know, you're coming in with an idea of those standards. It's within your power to make your code as good as you can reasonably do. And one thing I like to tell people to keep in mind when you're working towards these long-term projects is that progress is more important than perfection. There is this, you know, easy, it's, it's really easy to think that uh, if we had just started this code base recently, you know, it would be so perfect. But the reality is there is no working software in production that is perfect. And not even my side projects. I have, you know, hard-coded stuff here and there. I have, you know, not enough tests for this or that, and that's totally okay. Uh, the question is, when you're in that position, you know, can you just give an estimate that's going to make you also comfortable with how much you need to do? So taking it piece by piece, um, it's just way too easy to say, oh, I asked for permission and they said no, so now I'm sad. Um, but that's not the way you get stuff done, right? Sometimes you have to, you have to take things into your own hands and find a, a diplomatic way to lead by example. Um, and at the end of the day, if you can just show that you are maybe as productive or your code is clean and it gets maybe fewer comments on code review, people will be inspired. And in my experience, people also want to join the team that you're on because you've created that environment in an organic way without requiring, you know, top-down intervention for code quality. And this is exactly what happened at my last company. People wanted to join the team that I was working on because they were like, oh yeah, they have standards. They have, you know, they have a lot of automation. They put in the, the effort and the code base by now is nice to work in. And you build that reputation over years. Every single step matters and every developer has the ability to add to that legacy in a positive way. Well, I think that's probably a really good place for everybody listening to take a moment, reflect on what they're doing today with their their work and how they can kind of help move the needle forward a little bit better and make that incremental improvements and excellent advice there. So thank you so much for that, Monica. So a couple of last quick questions for you. What non-software development related book do you find yourself recommending to people most often? So... This is a really maybe appropriate answer given the the topic we were just discussing. One of the books that had like the biggest impact on me this year is called The Compound Effect. I think it's by Darren Hardy. And he talks about the power of small habits and how over time these can compound into something massive. So one of the examples that he gives is how one of his coworkers went from uh, you know, not being able to do a walking or jogging lap around the building to running marathons and quitting smoking. And all of these things happen by just taking one step forward at a time and not setting goals that are so big or so ambitious that when you fail to reach them, you get demoralized and quit. Um, and, and I think this is a really interesting kind of analogy for software and refactoring and making code maintainable. Because if you start with like a huge master plan of how you're going to refactor an enormous system, there's a very good chance it will just never reach that point uh, because you didn't think about it iteratively. Um, so yeah, I think the compound effect is really helpful, not just for uh, thinking about software, but also how you build your own personal habits. 
yeah, become productive, build your own stuff uh, and see results. Even if the day by day progress doesn't look amazing. When you look back in one year, it's always incredibly impressive what we managed to do by taking those small steps. Excellent. And where can listeners best follow your thoughts on software development and leadership and blogging online? Best place is probably on Twitter. Uh, I try not to tweet too much because I'm trying to be productive <laughs> instead of spending all my time there. But twitter.com slash Monica Lent, that's where you will find me. Um, and I am infrequently uh, publishing articles on my personal blog at monicalent.com. And that's kind of where the more nuanced discussion, I suppose, uh, ends up. Well, it's been such a delight having you on Maintainable, Monica. Thank you so much for joining us and Talking Shop. Yeah, thanks for having me, Robbie. It was fun to talk to you. Maintainable.